Thank you, everybody, for joining us for another podcast, another webcast, Wireless Works from Cambium Networks. I'm Darren Hermans, Product Manager at Cambium Networks. Today, we're joined by two service providers, uh, guys that have an interesting experience with, uh, with outdoor Wi-Fi networks. Um, I think you'll find a lot of things in common. You'd like to hear what they have to say, some of the things that are, that are important to them and the applications they've come across and how they solve some of these issues using, uh, using Wi-Fi. Now, each of these gentlemen have, have uh, had a, uh, got early versions of the new outdoor Wi-Fi 6 access point from Cambium. So we were very glad to hear some of their feedback and, and some of their use cases and to see how it validated the design that we did in the, in the new product that we just, just released uh, this past summer. So let's go ahead and introduce them both and get right into this. Um, Jeff, we'll start with you. Go ahead and uh, give us your high, tell us who you are and tell us how you use outdoor Wi-Fi. Absolutely. My name is Jeff Turner with Elevate Technology Group based in Oregon. We service uh, Oregon, Washington, and Hawaii as our primary locations. Uh, we were given the opportunity to test the new Wi-Fi 6 outdoor units uh, in an area that had uh, been struck with fire disaster uh, Labor Day weekend of last year. Um, during that disaster, uh, we helped bring some internet back in the area, uh, and that got us in touch with the local track, which was really a place that a lot of people uh, went to to escape the fire uh, that went through the area. The first major event back at that track uh, was one that required connectivity. Uh, it was one that um, was related to the Olympic trials uh, that was going on in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, and there was an extra day at the end of that that could come out and provide benefit to the local community and to that, to that track. And so our job was to bring in wireless uh, internet and distribute that to the vendors uh, and to the uh, spectators. This area really had no noise, uh, really clean RF-wise because there wasn't much left over after the fire that was there. Uh, but things started to, to, to come back and, and be built back at that point. Um, our goal, again, was to service the vendors and the spectators at one end of the track. Um, and uh, so we, we took two of these access points. Uh, we engineered wireless for uh, that one end of the track. And uh, we were surprised to find that the coverage and the antenna design and, and these APs uh, actually covered the whole track uh, and covered the the end to end on that. So. Uh, we were able to have well over 100 people connected to that network um, and, uh, and provide uh, well over 100 megs of traffic to, uh, to those participants. Wow. And, and Jeff, I'll come back to you in a minute. I want to ask you some questions about that because I think that uh, there's a, there's a, you packed a lot into that. But let's, let's come back to you in a minute here. Uh, let's introduce Chaz and have you, Chaz, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your first year, de your deployments with this technology and how you approach the outdoor Wi Fi. Sure. Chaz Hager with uh, North River IT. We're a managed service provider based in North Dakota. Uh, we have clients in uh, Texas and Alaska in addition to our local market. And uh, as part of addressing uh, an outdoor issue, we had an agricultural uh, rural setting where uh, someone needed outdoor coverage. And basically, a lot of these locations are without uh, adequate cell phone coverage. Uh, they may have it. It might be spotty. And uh, they have a, uh, one of the frequent issues in a, in a setting like that that would apply to other you know, aspects are these outbuilding concepts where you've got kind of a core uh, main building where the service might come into, but you have a number of surrounding buildings that were either built or constructed uh, where there was no design or thought around telecommunication type uh, connectivity, especially modern uh, tele telecommunication type or IP connectivity to these facilities. And so that creates a challenge because to properly cover the outbuildings, you typically need a lot of different pieces of hardware to make that work properly. And in this particular case, um, simply using the XB2T, meaning the outdoor uh, Wi-Fi 6 AP, we were able to get uh, coverage that you know, truly surpassed our expectations. Um, in this particular case, we actually got adequate coverage on the inside of the building when that was not our primary objective. Uh, this is a typical steel uh, type building that's known for uh, you know, removing any sort of radio signal and making, uh, making for real challenging Wi-Fi conditions. And so that's, that was a, a nice surprise as part of this installation. 
So, so both of you guys, uh, uh, Jeff and Chaz, you both talked about really kind of data access networks, but but in these days, um, you know, so, so that's probably your first first approach, right? So Jeff, you mentioned about providing Wi-Fi coverage for you know the teams that are there at that Olympic track event, and they not, they need to get online, you know, talk to their organizers and, and different people, just sending text messages, sending emails, you know, checking things, looking looking things up online. What else was going on there, though, Jeff? I mean, because that's that that's your first thing you think about with Wi-Fi, but what else goes on besides just at that that track event? Besides just data access for the for the, the the teams, yeah, absolutely. So data access for the team is is obviously important for for their communications, um, and to, to kind of add to what uh, what Chaz had had mentioned there is cell service in this area is almost non-existent as well, right? So mm -hmm. so that first line of communication really is relying on Wi-Fi uh, at at this area, and it sounds like a Chaz's location. Um, but that expanded to not just team and, and vendor access, but that expanded to spectator access uh, because people didn't have the ability to do their normal evening FaceTimes from the event, right, to, to family at home, uh, or communicate with uh, basic things like Twitter and, and uh, talk about how the event was going. On top of that, the uh, wireless network that was um, located there for the camera crew to do the live stream um, was having some issues. So this network also supported the live stream of, uh, of the cameras that were there. So the cameras that were down on the field, uh, as well as doing interviews uh, in the center of the track uh, and, and the sidelines. So um, it, was, it was a lot to uh, put into a new piece of equipment, but it worked fantastic. Well, that's, uh, that's great that you were able to actually provide that extra level of service. Did you plan for that or was that, that something just happened? No, no, that was something that just happened. We, uh, we were asked to only provide it for vendor access and, and the teams themselves. Uh, and provide some internet access to the the live stream, but not actually provide the Wi-Fi network that they were going to run on. Wow. Well, I'm glad you were there. I'm glad you were there. I'm glad you were on site with the right equipment uh, to be able to provide that and get that streaming access. So what that does is really th that's the world we live in now, right? Social media, streaming, live streaming, live online streaming. It really enables uh, any of these kinds of events and or organized events to really reach a much larger audience. Um, and I tell you what, Olympics are, are an important thing and, and people want to see what's happening. They want to be in touch and, and be involved. And so I'm glad you guys were able to do that. All right. So any, anything else that you guys were able to do? Um, anything unexpectedly, anything unexpected, positive or negative happened there? What else? Anything else happened? I think the biggest surprise out, out of the deployment, right, was was the coverage, right? And, and antenna design is really important, right? And, and before... I had really understood more about the product and stuff, right? It was, hey, let's get this out there. Uh, we're on a timeline, right? Um, and and the goal was not again to cover the whole field or the whole area, um, but that was that was the biggest surprise to me, right? Is is understanding that coverage and not just the coverage of uh, sending it to my device, but also the receive back on it. So there there definitely was a big surprise there, um, which allowed us to feel comfortable with opening it up to the public. Good, good. Glad to hear that. So, Chaz, back now. Talk to you about your you were you were talking about this agricultural uh, and setting, uh, Chaz, and I and I'm you know sort of picturing uh, you know these these ten buildings, ten side walls, and so forth, and uh, you know and lots of equipment around. Um, not not certainly not designed for data access or data networks. So, um, would you consider that? To, so, what's your how do you stress that type of network? I mean, does that does that put a stress on on a Wi-Fi network? Chaz, when, they, when you have that kind of environment, a yeah, lot so of metal, the, tin walls. For sure. So it's not like the noise floor of, say, a conference center uh, in Vegas, as you know, Jeff recently gave the example of being there. It's not that type of uh, interference. However, you know, in this particular example, a uh, lot of trucking in and out of this facility. And uh, so what happens is, is, is everything is very much real time. It's not maybe real high throughput type activities. Like for example, we talked about Wi-Fi calling, but it's very time sensitive in the sense that whether they're swapping trucks, drivers, whatever the case might be. And, you know, they used to have issues where, you know, it's the typical go stand outside on one foot and try and uh, communicate with the next driver scenario. And now they can easily and reliably communicate both from the yard and then also within the respective facilities uh, in the in the area. Uh, and so that really helps support the trucking operation. And so that's mm -hmm. kind of how it gets stressed is that you've got these real challenging environments that typically wouldn't have coverage without a very complex setup. Uh, and, com and the reason I use the word complex is because 
if you think about the number of clients, kind of the opposite of what Jeff experienced, you know, at any given time, this might only be five, 10, maybe 20 devices. So it's not a real high number of devices, but the real time communication is where the critical uh, component lies and they need that immediate feedback. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you have with uh, these voice, voice, Wi-Fi calling applications. You know, Wi-Fi calling is really turned out to be fantastic. It's really solved the, some of these problems with lack of cellular coverage. It's been a great benefit to the service providers. That's why they all support it, right? All of them do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile. Um, but and the interesting thing about that, you know, people, just, just for clarification, um, you know, we're all very familiar with the concept of using an app. You know, I use WhatsApp or I've used to use Skype years ago. You remember Skype? Anybody remember Skype anymore? Uh, probably not. Uh, before your time. <laughs> but, but, you know, we, we think about we think about FaceTime. Um, Jeff, you're mentioning FaceTime with family. So we're kind of familiar with those concepts, right? Using an app to do a video call or a phone call. But Wi-Fi calling is a little bit different. Because and the, 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 the sneaky thing about Wi-Fi calling is that you're using the IP protocol, but you're integrating it into the phone dialer, right? So it's not a separate app. So you're, you're going to open up your phone. You're just going to dial a phone number just like you normally do without thinking about it or dial it. You pick a person from your contact list more appropriately, and you're going to click the call button. But you don't really know. You didn't really consciously open up an app to try to make that call work. And it works. You don't have to think about it. Don't have to think about it. And I think that that's, a, that's the key thing about Wi-Fi calling. The real advantage there is that people don't have to think about it. So Chaz, when you, when you do this, uh, you look at this capability for, for Wi-Fi um, ability to, to design, uh, to, to architect this network um, for those in environments, what, what is this going to mean for, what kind of budget are you looking at? I mean, are these complex, expensive networks? What, what can we do about that? You mean in the future with this type of deployment or? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you, look at, you look at the complexity that might be required to deploy um, a Wi-Fi network to provide that critical communications you described. Yeah. So maybe in a past example, and we've done other deployments like this where you would have uh, multiple subscriber modules, so a point to multi-point. Mm -hmm. And then you, in addition, have switching gear on the inside of the respective buildings and then access points to cover those buildings. You know, the amount of equipment and then complexity to make that system work can be overwhelming for some of these um, even smaller shops that they're having a hard time justifying not just the cost, but just the level of input required, whether it's cabling and everything else. Uh, a lot of times what I find, you know, one of the biggest uh, roadblocks to a lot of installs ends up being cabling, access to where it needs to be, the cost to get it done, uh, all of the things that require getting the equipment in place. And in this particular scenario, you know, this equipment and using the advantage of the coverage of this type of equipment, it really will mitigate a lot of those challenges by getting one or two, or in Jeff's case, I think you said you had two devices at the end. Um, you know, if you would have wanted to provide that level of coverage and you think about the amount of cabling and devices you would have needed on any other yeah. system. Yeah, no, it would have been significant to, to do that. And, and it was cost prohibitive for the facility. Same thing, right? Is they, they wanted that originally, but it was a pullback uh, because Cabling doesn't exist over there, and the cost is prohibitive. Yeah, more yeah. equipment. More equipment always uh, often leads to more complexity, and uh, that means more more systems to 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 architect, more systems that can break, uh, more more deploy, more uh, uh, service and support and maintenance required. So, less is 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 a good thing. Uh, Jeff, you you had mentioned your business also operates, um, um, you know, Elevate Technologies. You guys operate in in the Pacific Northwest region. But you also cover over Hawaii. I mean, you, you mentioned that as well. So why don't you t tell us a little bit about some of your deployments there and what, what sort of applications are required? Um, you know, what are you looking for, Jeff, when you, you, you set out to deploy a network and architect a network that you're going to deploy uh, in, in a state that's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a three and a half hour, four hour flight from you, right? So tell us about that. How do you, what do you look for? Yeah, well, and, and on top of the flight nowadays, the flight is an expensive over there right now. It's the car rentals, right? I don't know if you've heard that lately, but the, the car rentals all just, I mean, they're non-existent for the most part. So the cost went way up, right? But um, what you're really looking for is you're looking for products that can can be flexible, right? You want, you want the Swiss Army knife uh, in your bag. Uh, so that you can ship uh, equipment out to a location that's that's pre-configured, right? Um, and you have the ability to get feedback from that equipment before the users do, right? 
So this is a great example is that, that we had pre-configured uh, equipment for a school uh, out on the islands. Um, and they are a school that have a big outdoor focus, right? Um, their, their focus of outdoor was prior to COVID and even became more after COVID hit, right? So as we, we originally went over there and looked at the location, um, we were asked to make sure that the picnic tables have Wi-Fi so that the Chromebooks can connect, right? And the iPads and the watches and the teacher's equipment. And all of a sudden, uh, you have mobile uh, whiteboards and, and things like that, right? And so, um, so the deployment really became a density and coverage conversation versus one or the other. You usually have a, hey, we have this location, just focus on the density of that location, right? In this case, it was density and coverage uh, across multiple buildings and, and a, a fairly large campus, right? So, um, so that was really something where the, the tools that we had to send out there, uh, Cambium uh, XP access points and, and the outdoor ones that we're talking about here, uh, right, were, were those tools. And uh, the people that were on site did not have to have uh, engineering background in wireless, right, uh, or carry extra tools necessarily uh, around um, we could get a lot of that feedback straight out of the access point and the interface on those access points to, to provide that engineering remotely. So, so, so Jeff, you did, you've given us two use cases. The first one you talked about was this track event um, in, in Oregon, uh, outside of Eugene, Oregon. Uh, so I, I can imagine it's a fairly rural area. And I don't think you had any Wi-Fi interference out there. Is that safe to say? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. None. Zero. <laughs> well, it's kind of the good news and the bad news, right? No, there's no wireless out there. That's the bad news, and it's also the good news. Uh, now, your second deployment is it the same? Did you when you when you deployed in Hawaii, what sort of interference did you see there? Yeah. Did you no, have to so, deal with that at all? So very interesting, right? There was an existing uh, wireless network in the facility that couldn't come down while we were deploying the new one, right? Um, and then of course there are neighbors uh, around that area that are other businesses and homes. And so I remember in one part of the, the campus, uh, one of the buildings was heavily impacted with neighbors that were apartment complex uh, and nice big wide channels for their slow DSL services uh, that were there. We always love when those defaults are put in place. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, the, the existing wireless network uh, that's uh, on campus that we had to kind of uh, commingle with for a while, right? And, and as we continue through these deployments, uh, it, it becomes more and more um, apparent uh, standardizing on Wi-Fi 6 is going to help a lot with that. But yes, there was there was interference and different interference in different areas, right? Um, the outdoor interference was very different than obviously the indoor stuff. Um, and then self-interference is always a, always a question mark when you're dealing with multiple systems that are controlled from multiple uh, controllers and things like that. So that's very different. There, there was a lot of uh, um, noise around the area as well as the noise floor uh, that was a lot higher, right, obviously. Um, and then also things that were moving, those, those automatically uh, channels, automatic channel selecting home routers uh, are a pain, right? And you have to identify how, how are you going to do that without uh, knocking on everybody's door and asking them if you could change their Wi-Fi setting, because that's not going to happen. Yeah, because okay. they're going to agree to that. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, and of course, everyone just wants to turn their power up because they think that, that that's going to fix the issue, right? And that's, that's not always the answer. But yes, very right. different environment. Uh, and very different uh, use for the tool that was in the tool bag. Good. Well, I'm glad you had the tools you needed to to deal with that. I always I always love it when you have these you know default settings, uh, 80 megahertz wide channel, then you connect it to a, a 20 megabit per second DSL service, and you kind of wonder why are you using so much spectrum. Um, but just yeah. it just causes a lot of complexity. But that's the world we live in, though, right? We can uh, we it's just that's just the reality today, and it's going to. Uh, it's not going to get any better. It's just going to continue that way. So we have to learn how to deal with it. Um, did you have the tools in the equipment to, to deal with that kind of interference? Yeah, we absolutely did. And we had the, the visibility into understanding likely what the user experience was as well, right? Uh, with some of the, the quality metrics and, and understanding uh, retransmits and, and MCS levels and stuff like that. So um, there was, there was a, a definite positive in the tool bag. Good, fantastic, um, Chaz. I don't think we we didn't cover very much about your your business, um, your North River IT, and what you guys do. Um, are you, is this fair to say you're a managed service provider or a? Yes, absolutely. Okay. That's yep. a better better way to describe it. Well, and mm -hmm. what type of markets would that be? What, what do you think? Um, what's one or two for you for you? 
yeah, we do uh, a lot with like construction and that would be more industrial type construction. So think of like refinery, gas plant, that type of activity. Mm -hmm. uh, so oil and gas and then uh, uh, legal services and then uh, K, K through 12. So obviously Jeff's outside example resonates with me with that on the K through 12 side. And then yeah. the construction industry in particular, um, you know, one of the big things for them uh, is that plays directly into this conversation is a lot of the uh, time capture. Uh, they have different technologies that they're using a lot of times geofence type where people are badging in and out. And uh, because this product is so new, we haven't had an opportunity to really uh, put it out there in that way. But we know that that it's a it's a slam dunk for the, those types of activities where they historically would want the time capture to occur at a significantly different location than where the uh, actual Internet comes into the, you know, it's usually a temporary service and where that comes into the facility. OK, wow. So you, you actually, I guess where you're where you're at there in Bismarck, North Dakota, you kind of have to be a full service uh, service provider, don't you? You have to have a lot of uh, flexibility. Uh, Accurate. Yeah, yeah, you, you do. And that's, that's, that's good. So I'm glad we could provide that. So what Cambium provided you guys was the XV2-2T0. Now that's, that's an outdoor Wi-Fi 6, two by two. The thing about that particular product, when you look at, you know, why, why that product? Why does that one really work well? It comes down to the antenna design. So specifically on the, the 2T0, what Cambium looked to do, or our objective from day one, was really design the very best antenna we possibly can do without compromise. So we didn't compromise you know, uh, size, for example, to get to the very best uh, possible antenna. So I think we talked, you guys have described some pretty positive um, experiences. So I got to ask you, uh, how about the other flip side of that coin? Uh, is there, is there, was there a downside? <laughs> I, mean, I got to ask the question, right? Uh, was there anything that was a, a surprise to you guys when you saw the, the product? Anything, any negatives? I can say that uh, I think Chaz and I probably had a, a similar uh, experience when it came off the truck and showed up at the door was what did we order? What is so big, right? The size is, is very large. Uh, that was definitely a surprise. <laughs> exactly. I walked, I walked into the office one day and I was like, what is this box and where did it come from? Yeah. How, how many are in it, right? <laughs> yeah. And it was uh, one. Yeah. <laughs> it was a single one. use. Like, <laughs> it's just so one funny. AP in that box. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. Uh, it definitely is is taller. It's at 1.8 times taller than our you know our previous generation technology, but we 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 thought that that was going to be a good compromise. Um, uh, you know, good antenna antenna design is is still all antennas are a compromise of some of some form or other, and so you, you try to compromise something to get to get your maximum performance or or meet a particular use case. In this particular product, we we went for maximum performance, and so. So we actually designed that, that antenna um, for both the 2.4 gigahertz and the 5 gigahertz band. Both of them are, are optimized uh, to give it the most efficiency, the highest efficiency rating we can. We can design an, an antenna for an outdoor, outdoor application. So I'm, I'm pretty happy that you guys uh, uh, found, it, found it positive. So let's, let's get back and talk to some of these applications um, again. So we, we, we talked about Wi-Fi calling and Wi-Fi calling re, uh, uh, round trip latency, uh, round trip time is important. Packet latency is, you know, Wi-Fi calling is very sensitive to any kind of a packet latency. So that's a that's a, a key key thing for Wi-Fi calling, a key requirement for Wi-Fi calling. So another one you guys have talked about was video conferencing. Um, you know, Jeff, you mentioned uh, some of the things. You, uh, FaceTime is a video conferencing application, uh, and there. So that that's another one we talked about: video conferencing, Wi-Fi calling. Uh, so, Chaz, what about uh, in, in your industrial type applications and you're looking at like the uh, rural agriculture, what type of equipment is out there um, that might need to connect to that Wi-Fi besides just, um, you know, somebody's smartphone? Right? What yeah, else so, is out there? So the time clock is the one that first comes to mind. That's probably the most common next, uh, next item on the list that we'd see that's connected after maybe more traditional uh, IT type devices. Uh, and those can time clocks can be finicky. You know, they want they want to be on, and like any other IoT device, there's just not a lot of intelligence built in, meaning troubleshooting is always limited. Uh, and then, uh, in addition to those, there are some uh, remote wireless type badge scanners. Uh, you know, that that used to be more of an issue. Now, a lot of times, those apps are built into the mobile devices, so that's improved. 
And uh, there are some other vehicle and equipment monitoring things, but I, you know, I think one of the reasons we haven't seen a ton of that is because there hasn't been that type of outdoor reliable Wi-Fi network present at these locations in the past. So we haven't been getting those requests. It's an IOT. We've been hearing about that for so much, right? So many years. Um, it's quietly taking over and it, it doesn't, uh, uh, you know, IOT is it's kind of that weird word that people define in all different ways, but, but really when it comes right down to it, it's just it's really automating uh, many things that we used to have to do manually. We're not, we can now automate them and using a network uh, connection to, uh, to bring some automation to different types of, of applications and environments. Um, Jeff, you're, you're talking about the, the, I want to go back for a minute to your, you, you described your, uh, your outdoor network for the Olympic trials. And uh, you described initially that you, you had data access so that the teams could have access. You have Wi-Fi calling, you have video conferencing, you had live streaming, upstream live streaming. So there's, there's, you know, four different things there. Um, how did you, how did you handle all of that with, with, you've got four different services all competing for essentially the same pipe. What, yeah, what sort of, what's your strategy there? Yeah, prioritizing the device uh, based on its connected SSID in the device is how we handled it. So we didn't have the the uh, budget, we'll say, for that location to put devices upstream, right? It was uh, literally a Cambium backhaul radio. Uh, we used uh, 450Bs uh, from a school close by that had some fiber and went through some trees, got there, right? And then handed off into a, a dumb switch, which then went to these APs. So we didn't have anything to do a lot of the intelligence around uh, traffic shaping or QoS or anything. And so we relied on the uh, QoS features inside the access point based on SSID and, okay. and device connected. Okay, so you, you applied the QoS right at the access point. Uh, yeah. How about, did you rate limit the, um, did you create any rate limits to, to create some separation in the traffic? We did. So we, we did not rate limit, obviously, the uh, video traffic or anything that was regarding the live streaming. Um, that was happening there, but we did limit per user. Um, so we limited the devices per user on the open network, right? The, the guest access. Um, right. And we limited that just so we could say, hey, what, what's a fair amount of bandwidth that someone could use here? And it's not gonna limit them. It's gonna give them a quick download if they need a picture download or whatever it is, as well as a quick upload if they're uploading a video to Facebook or something like that. Um, so we did, we did rate limiting per device uh, as well uh, to do a, a fair amount of bandwidth for each device that was connected to the public open Wi-Fi. Okay, so people are gonna ask, what, what was the number you used? Yeah, 25 megs. 25 megabits? Yep. Okay, okay, because they're gonna ask, right? They're gonna ask, <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, and, and uh, I'm definitely someone who believes that if you could give them more um, and still have some fair queuing in there, you should open it up to them, right? Um, a lot of hotels these days are still trying to push 10 to 20, 30 megs of bandwidth to, to a subscriber in the room, uh, even though it's free. And um, the hotels that we manage, we aim for 100 minimum, right, to those devices yeah. um, and designing for, for what they can do futuristic, not the other way around. So uh, we did 25 based on our, our limitations around what was at that event and also the first time using these outdoor APs. Okay. So so uh, let's talk about the, uh, the types of devices a little bit because that, that, that has a big impact on the overall network performance, right? Because ultimately, we, we, there's a connection between the device and the access point. There, there's a connection. There's a wireless connection between those two devices. And so there's different capabilities of those devices. There's different, uh, there's different firmware, different technology. So um, um, Chaz, I would, think, I would think in the IoT space and sort of the industrial type applications that you do, that you see a lot of that. You see different types of devices different types of capabilities on those client devices and different types of firmware. Is that a fair statement? And I, yeah, and not only that, I mean, in addition to seeing the different types of device and, and having a, a true lack of uniformity around, say, firmware, then you run into things like, oh, when you program this particular clock, let's say, it needs this, this, and this box checked, or else it's going to download all these other things and it won't work right. And it's just so not uh you know it's for lack of a better word it's so not a pc <laughs> that you can just manage properly yeah. and set the policy the way it should be yeah. are, are those, i would imagine are those... that there's oh sorry for interrupting no, please. I, I just Go throw ahead. in there i'd imagine that you still run into things like no dual band radios in those devices too exactly right? yeah that would be so a, you only have 4 or, uh, 2.4 uh instead of 4 and 5 right yeah um that that also becomes a struggle 
Wow, uh, that's a good point. Um, Chaz, do you see on these IoT devices, is there a particular preference for band? Do they tend to prefer 2.4 or is that? Oh, Jeff's accurate. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these devices, you know, we've had some where we like boot them up and they don't even see it. And we're like, oh yeah, that's right. We did this network in five only. And uh, that's why I can't see the device. <laughs> okay. Right. So you, you, you so we can't uh, we can't shut off 2.4 gigahertz any day anytime soon. Uh, not quite yet. It's it's bit us every time we've done it. How about that? I think that's true as well as I don't know if you've seen this too, but I, I've seen where uh, some of the we'll say goal of a hundred dollar netbook type things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they're using wireless cards that are from five years ago still, trying to keep that cost down, right? Exactly. Um, and on things that are not backwards compatible or or accepting lower bit rates. Um, they don't even see the wireless network sometimes. Yeah, yeah, we've we've thankfully, you know, some of our, our larger districts have at least been aggressive about addressing that because they know how negatively it impacts everybody else. Yeah. So, but we have seen that, and yeah, that's just another example of a of a true pain point when you're trying to support so many different and various clients. So we need, so we do, we do need to keep. Fortunately, these the newer devices. Uh, newer access points, all, all dual band and support all the different the newer protocols. So uh, hopefully we have the right level of backwards compatibility and, uh, and can still handle that. All right. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate you guys' time. Um, so is there anything else that you, that you would like to cover that we haven't uh, talked about yet? I mean, we've, we've talked quite a bit about the applications, uh, Wi-Fi calling, video conferencing, IoT, and you guys have hit all those. Uh, we've talked about uh, typical devices, and you've seen everything from older phones to new phones and uh, everything in between. Um, indoor, outdoor Wi-Fi, we talked about that as well. Any, any last thoughts that you might, uh, in your in your networks and the type of, type of customers that you guys uh, support that we'd like to talk about? Leave that I question I open. Anything. I think um, just as, as a feedback item, right, I think uh, digging into antenna design on a, a separate episode would be a lot of fun, right? Um, uh, the people that listen to this um, would probably be interested in that if I could speak for them in, in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. But also myself, just uh, understanding more in depth uh, around what Cambium goes through when designing antenna, right? Specifically around this or, or separate. But those are yeah. things that people don't see a lot. They, they go select antennas based off of an experience or, or their mm -hmm. game ratings, right? Um, and I think it's really important to understand more about the, the antenna world. So that's kind of where I'll leave it. I don't, I don't have I, any other questions. So. I like I like that. That's that's a good lead in. That's a good that's a good thing. I'd like to talk about that in the future as well. Sometimes people look at the, you know, they they look at the peak gain, right? The antenna, the peak gain. The peak gain is, you know, it's five, it's it's seven, it's ten. It's kind of like looking at a car and saying, well, the you know, the what's what's the maximum speed this car can drive? Well, is that really the right question you want to be asking? Uh, when we when we set about to you know design antenna, I'll give you a little, little, little preview on this then. We set about to design the antenna. We were not looking for what is that peak gain number, uh, because reality that's not the right number. You know how fast that car can drive is not going to is not going to uh, help you with efficiency. It's not going to help you get around town. It's not going to help you uh, get on a long trip and do both of those things. Because cars, you know, look at cars. We don't we don't just drive them around town. We don't just drive them on the freeway. We you know they they use them for everything. So same thing when it comes to good Wi-Fi design and good antenna design, we, we do need to look for a high efficiency antenna that gives us that capability to, to operate in, in these different environments. And so there's a particular you know, set of design goals that you want to attach when you, uh, when you look for, for designing an antenna that is, is designed for high efficiency, not just high peak gain. So yeah, thank you for that, uh, Jeff. I'll, I'll definitely queue that up and we'll get some information out there for, to people on that and how we went about designing that Probably, I'll probably drag one of our engineers into a call and uh, and report him talking about it as well. Do they enjoy that? <laughs> they actually will. You know, I think they they actually will. But the nice thing about it is, when we set about designing the antenna, you you could say, well, you know, Darren, antennas are antennas, and antennas antennas have been around for many many years, and um, you know, so what's so important about this? And and really, what you know, Wi-Fi six itself is, is a high efficiency protocol. And, and you could have said, well, they could have just made Wi-Fi 6 a faster version of Wi-Fi 5, but they didn't. That's not what they did. They, went, they set about making it more efficient. And so that's what I like about Wi-Fi 6. So in the applications you guys have described, um, uh, capacity issues you had, uh, high density, low density, long range, all those different things are handled by Wi-Fi 6. 
Couple of key things about Wi-Fi 6 allows it to do this. Uh, for example, one of the things is that Wi-Fi 6 at short distances, when the, when the signal to noise ratio is very high, you're, you're gonna get the higher modulations, the higher MCS rates. And you'll push speeds of m multiple hundreds of megabits per second at short distances. But what happens as the distance starts to increase? Well, Wi-Fi tends to have a sharp cliff, a, a sharp fall off because those MCS rates have to start modulating down and changing to a lower MCS rate as it gets out further. Now in the years past, uh, companies might, might put in some, some settings, oh, I can change the round trip time, I can do some tweaks here and there to make a long range Wi-Fi work better, but then it doesn't work at short range. So you sacrifice some of your short range performance to get greater long range. Here's the key thing about Wi-Fi 6, this efficiency aspect of it. It dynamically adapts to different environments, both short range, medium and long range, it actually adapts and changes its operating mode as the client uh, distance increases. So it maintains that high efficiency, maintains that high rate of, of high bit rate and high reliability, signal reliability, even as the client uh, in, uh, distance increases. There are three ways that Wi-Fi 6 does this. One is DCM, which is dual subcarrier modulation. And, and that's a technology that allows the, the payload to be copied to two separate subcarriers, two different frequencies essentially, so that you get, you get frequency diversity, you get uh, uh, a subcarrier diversity so that the client can actually receive both of them, pick the one that has the best signal for more signal reliability. Another thing it does is it boosts the preamble by 3 dB. So you get a short burst in time, extra 3 dB, extra doubling of the power for extremely short bursts of time, which helps that range to increase and get that reliable signal at a greater range. And the third thing is the dynamic guard intervals of Wi-Fi 6, the ability to now adapt from 0.8 up to 3.2 microseconds, uh, increasing the range, increasing the distance, the gap between the, the packets, so that now, again, the client who's receiving the packets uh, has more reliable chance of receiving all the packets because there's a little bit more time between each transmission. So those, those are some of the things that helps uh, Wi-Fi 6 to be more efficient when it comes to outdoor Wi-Fi. And so pairing it with a high efficiency antenna was a, was a perfect uh, objective of ours and um, something that we really wanted to do. So I thank you guys for your time today. I appreciate the time you spent talking to us about some of your applications and some of the, the objectives that you needed to see when you design your outdoor and indoor Wi-Fi networks and the ability to cover all of these environments from a single access point. And I think that many of our, our listeners will have some things in common. They'll want to have some follow-up questions and they'll have a lot of uh, things that they'll want to know how you did some things and we'll, we'll definitely get that information out to them. So thank you again very much and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.